differences. I'm going to pre-start by pushing my last layer of data back over to the telescope because we pushed the molecules, the slip event, and the earthquake. And not the earthquakes yet, so I'll do that next. Three thousand rows. If anybody's watching this, I'm uh, highlighting a part of my table. I'm clicking on visualize selection. That's the gateway into pushing your data back to telescope. Notice I have a date column, and I've remembered what that's for. Um, I kind of um, arbitrarily, in this particular data set to simply set the uh, sequence of events to be increasing one after another. And uh, so those are days. So the start date in telescope gets assigned to the date column in my data. Longitude, latitude, depth, magnitude. And when the depth is uh, the selected version of upness and downness as opposed to altitude, well, altitude the default is meters. When you make it depth, it thinks, ah, oh, you're probably a seismologist, so you want to have your numbers in kilometers. Okay, so my matching is done. Step three, view and worldwide telescope. Click on this, and my data appears. Now, I earlier showed that the, the value of the right click on the layer. And here, my data has come up as red, and um, I'm going to do the right click on the layer again to get to my properties dialog. And I'm going to, first of all, make my scale darker. And then I'm going to right click, and instead of going to the properties, I'm going to go to color opacity and select white and make my data white. So now I'm back to the powdered sugar data. So I have my earthquakes, I have the slip event down here which is still active in time. And now it's 11 after, so I'm officially started. Um, so the last thing uh, that I'm going to do in this sequence of events is uh, you'll recall that we've pulled the data from Worldwide <laughs> Telescope into Excel. And now I've pushed all three of those layers that I pulled back into Worldwide Telescope. So now the layer manager shows me that I have a molecules layer, I have a sheet one layer, which happens to be my polygons. Those are those four square, three squares. And then I have a slip event layer, and I have the earthquakes layer. And the earthquakes layer is interesting, at least it's interesting to me, because um, it actually has a time column associated with it. But you'll notice that when I highlight this layer right now, there is no time series associated with it. So you see the earthquake events all over the Earth. But if I click on the time series, suddenly that time component becomes activated and my earthquakes all go away. Now I can drag my time slider back and forth, and the earthquake events go up, 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 except they don't. And they don't because their duration is probably not long enough. So I'm going to go back to my properties. Date time, crank up the decay to something huge. It's a little bit of a, an art to, to using Worldwide Telescope and balancing the way that your parameters work. Um, and I'm also going to make it brighter. Okay. So now I've brightened up my data, and because um, I'm not working from this sort of cumulative or aggregate, but I'm instead I have time series data. And I can do this little sparkly thing. So that's sort of the sequence in which these earthquakes occurred. You can see the um, Northeast Indian Ocean earthquake, I think, is at the end of this data set right there. That was uh, 2004, maybe? Sometime. OK, so now I'm going to turn the time series aspect. Oh, well, as long as I'm belaboring the time aspect, actually, let me just do one other thing. Um, 
I mentioned before that there is a time state in Worldwide Telescope. Currently, it's in real time, so I'm going to speed up the rate at which time plays. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to make sure that the quakes layer that I'm interested in is selected, that the time series is turned on, and that I also check this auto loop. Okay, so now I'm going to speed up the rate at which time plays. So now I'm times 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. 100,000 million. Okay, so that's something like a comfortable rate. And you'll notice that my time slider here is chugging along, but I'll go one more factor of 10. It's a bit overkill, but. And you'll see that when this time slider reaches the end, it'll loop back to the beginning. So here's my time series data of earthquake events, and I'm able to manipulate the interface and watch that data playing back. So I can go um, freedom of motion, I can go anywhere I like, see what's happening. Last thing I want to do is simply just create a tour. So the data is sitting here in Worldwide Telescope. I'm going to close my Excel spreadsheets. Save it. Okay. Excel is turned off. And now I've decided that I want to communicate about um, earthquakes and molecular clouds and a bar chart on south of Cote d'Ivoire. So I'm going to create a tour. So again, I come over to the Explore tab, the little sub tab below it. I say New, Slide Based Tour. And I'll put down um, Workshop, name. The only thing you need to fill in here is just a name for this tour. Say OK. And here we are with a, a tour editing environment. So I add a new slide, but before I do that, I'll just go down to a position a perspective that I happen to like, because that's going to become the initial perspective of the tour. So we'll start here. Now I'm going to say add a new slide. And what's going to do is it's going to capture a thumbnail of what we're looking at. You can't see it very well here, but uh, it does give you a little thumbnail of what you're looking at. And there's also a text field here, so I'm going to write uh, tour start. And the tour is by default 10 seconds. The slide is by default 10 seconds long, but I want it to be a little shorter, so I'm going to say 06.0. .0. And now my, it takes a moment, but it gets ingested and says, oh, this is a six second long tour. So you'll notice the subtle little ear up here on the corner of the slide that says that we're at the first state of two in this tour. There's another ear over here that's grayed out, but if I click on it, it becomes illuminated. So right now, both the start and end state for this slide are the same. So I'll go back to the beginning. Here we are. Now I can manipulate the perspective right now without touching what the tour slide does. Okay? So I'm just going to do a slow pan around, and maybe zoom down a little bit. So now I've changed my perspective. And remember that right-click mantra, the light right-click is your friend in Worldwide Telescope. I right-click on this, and holy cow, there's this huge menu of things that I can do with respect to this slide. And in particular, I can set the end camera position. That's the right-hand ear. That's the second state. So now here we are, and we've now created a six-second tour that will go from this perspective to this perspective. Let's check. Play. Here we are, one, sorry, two, three, four, five, six. So hooray, fantastic. Now I want to keep going from here. I want to go start running around and looking at my other data. So of course I want to create another slide. I'd like the next slide to pick up where this one leaves off. So my first thought is right click. Let's right click on the slide. If I add a new slide, then that's going to be a different pathway. So I'm just going to work from the create 
our duplicate slide at n position. Okay? So here we are. Boom. And here's the next slide. That's now our focus. The next slide is six seconds long. It's inherited the duration from the previous slide. It's six seconds long, and we don't know where the end position is yet because we haven't set it. In fact, by default, the end position is the start position. So if I played this right now, we'd just sit here for six seconds. But instead, let's, again, manipulate the interface a little bit. I'm sorry. Right click, set and camera position. Okay, check it again. 12 seconds, four, five, six. And you can see it changed the direction it was panning. That was a tri slide transition. Five, six, and there we are. Okay, for my next trick, I would like to duplicate this slide at the end position and now I'm going to go back and I'm going to edit this text field. This is my second slide, so simply say second slide. My third slide, I'm going to pull back from this molecular cloud, so I'll title it Pull Back. You do not have to write anything in here. It's just kind of useful if your slide, if your tour becomes long, to sort of keep track of where you are and what you're doing. So this is going to be the, the pull back. I click on that ear and make sure I'm at the start position. I don't have to click the second ear because I'm going to accomplish the setting the end state with the right click menu. I'm just going to pull back to there. So now I've set the end camera position for the third slide and I'm just going to assume that everything's okay and this is going to work great. I'm going to duplicate the slide at the end position here. So now here we're on the fourth slide. We'll call it way back. And here I'm going to change the status of the quakes layer to be non-time series. So now all my quakes are showing up at the same instant in time, which is to say they have no time duration or no time persistence. Now I want to pull back to way back. I should do this while looking over here. And I'll make this, since I'm kind of going a long ways, I'll make the slide a little bit longer. So again, I highlight that text, and I'll make that a 10-second slide. Okay. And then I right-click on the slide, and I say, set end camera position. So. Let's find out what happens. First slide, second slide, third slide, and fourth slide. And that was slower, that was 10 seconds. Okay, so here we are, and the last thing I'm going to do in this tour is I'm going to go down to where that slip event happens, and I'm going to set up the tour to play the slip event, okay? So first, let's pan back down there. I'm going to duplicate the slide at the end position. To slip event, so it's a transitional. Hang on a second. I'm going to go back to my initial position of the slide by clicking on that ear. I'm going to turn off all the earthquakes. And I'm going to say, set start camera position. So that says, okay, when you start this slide, only have these three layers turned on, but turn off the earthquakes. Now, I feel like I'm busy. I'm going to go head on down to that slip event. don't want to interrupt, but just for a second here. One of the things you can do, if you want to make more artistic transitions, instead of turning things off and on instantly, use a slide to fade them from being fully opaque to fully transparent. Yeah. So you can use the trick of having an intermediate slide that, sh that 
shows something but has it completely invisible and then fades in over that time or have it fade out. And that's usually more graceful if you want more artistic uh, impressions. Sometimes you want things to snap on the screen, but sometimes that can be jarring. So, okay. so uh, do consider you can also use the opacity for beginning and end of a slide. Um, you can also slide things in from the side or, or do other techniques like that too. Right. So just to reiterate or to emphasize what John's saying, there's a lot of opacity control in here a lot of fine, fine details and opacity control is one of the nicest as far as creating an artistic presentation because you can bring stuff in and out and you can also use that to control how things are rendered on top of each other. So, good point. Um, okay, so I've come to my perspective on my um, slab model and now I'm going to set the end camera position for this slide. But I don't want it to take 10 seconds to get down here. Rather, I'd like to get down here fairly quickly. So I'll say you have three seconds to get there. And now I'm going to duplicate this slide at the end position. And we're going to show the slip event. So this is the slip event slide. It starts here. And you'll notice that there is a time. So we're sitting at the right time. And now I want to watch the slip event go. And there's the end of the slip event. So now again, I right click on the slide and I say set end camera position. So you'll notice that I have not changed my viewing perspective in this slide. I've only changed the time state associated with the end of the slide. Okay, so I don't want to sit through the entire tour to watch whether this worked. I just want to back up to the previous tour and I'll say preview of the tour from here. So we've quickly fell down to our perspective and then Oh, it didn't play very well. Let's give it another chance. I'm going to make the transition last a little bit, the, the slip event last a little bit longer, too. Zero, nine, dot, zero. Uh oh. Sorry, my power was disconnected. Also, uh, for uh, in my perspective in the back of the room, I can see people who are playing around with tours. There is this little artifact that if you hover your mouse over the uh, top portion of the screen, it brings up the editing uh, tool palette. So when you start a tour, if you leave your mouse sitting right in the hover position, then immediately once the tour starts, it'll try to pop that up, and you'll have this cycling back and forth between popping the uh, palette up and back, which will cause your screen to jump between full screen mode and edit mode. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, that's an artifact. We'll probably try to fix that in the future. Um, but if you move your mouse off of the palette, then you, you won't have that experience. Okay, well, my power is disconnected, so I've just lost that entire tour. So, save early, save often. But while it's rebooting here, um, can I ask um, if, if we could uh, sort of take another pause for questions or um, thoughts at this point? That'd be great. Sure. Can you, uh, you want to just display this somewhere? Can you export it to a WMV or? Right, the question is can you export? the tour playback to a WMV file. And this question comes up a lot. And uh, I guess I'd leave it to Jonathan to answer that. It's a Jonathan's uh, purview. So as I was uh, mentioning this, the concept of our tours was based around this kind of three phase uh, narrative, contextual exploration, and data awareness and when you flatten it down into a movie you kind of take you just leave the narrative and then you lose all the other contextual exploration tools and the data behind it and so from a philosophical standpoint as it started out as a you know inside research you know in in that uh in that vein we kind of really wanted to emphasize the uh you know that that three-phase aspect of this whole educational model and communication model 
And so we try to make it as difficult as possible for people to bake these down into a video and give up the other two components. Uh, so um, we had a playback engine that we, w was useful for being able to do that on the web. And then the idea was, since it's free, uh, it'll also have a viral component to it and that when you exchange it with someone else and they install the client to be able to view that file, then they'll be able to learn how to use that tool, they'll be able to explore it, and then they'll be able to use that themselves and, and uh, create a network effect. Um, but we also realized that people would say, hey, um, uh, so like the Houston Museum of uh, Natural Science wanted to do a full dome planetarium show, and they actually need to bake these into a, uh, a, a future, I mean, a, a, um, a, a movie that actually plays over six projectors and do a dome master version. And then maybe Discovery Channel wants to make a, uh, a Discovery Channel nature special or something, and they want to actually have some space scenes that are created with this. And so for those type of high-end uh, clients that need this as a production system, we have the ability to uh, actually display high quality discrete frames to a, uh, a set of images. So essentially you create a tour and then you use the export tool and it will export just the video sequences uh, in their, at the resolution that you request in very good uh, quality with all of the tiles downloaded at the highest resolution, et cetera. And that's available um, for, for those type of exports. We've also been pretty successful for people who wanted to use Camtasia to capture both the audio and video stream to be able to make it, put it on YouTube and stuff for things with more reach. Um, and eventually we're going to get for the ability to actually do uh, uh, video files directly from it. Now that we've been out for a few years, uh, we realize that with uh, over 5 million installed base, that's great. But there's a lot of people who just keep asking for, I want to put this on YouTube. I want to put this on YouTube, make it really easy for me. And so we're finally going to relent and uh, um, let people do that. But we're still hoping that it will encourage them to use the uh, authoring tour, even though they get to the quick and dirty version of it. OK, so I've started another um, uh, tour here. And I'm, this is just entirely to illustrate the last point that I wanted to make about tour editing, um, where I have set a start time here and an end time here. And so I play the tour. And that's great. The tour is done. And then I will duplicate the slide at the end position. And I will go back in time to before the data starts moving. And then I will reset start camera position. So now the time is associated with the beginning of the slip event. And this time I want to pan around over to here while the slip event happens. So I move the slot time slider to the time at the end of the slide. And again, I right click. I set end camera position. And now we should have two seven second slides. One of them watches the event from a static position and the other one pans and allows time to play back. So here's the seven seconds from a static position. And then it's going to jump back, I hope, and do it again with a pan. OK. So the last thing I'll do here, this is the last thing, I promise, is I will duplicate slide it in position. So there's a dummy slide here. And I'm going to. Go back to the previous slide, insert some text, this text is a link back to the first slide. And uh, I'm right clicking on that in order to link to a slide. I'm linking it to the first slide. So now what I've done is I've installed some link text here. And if I right click on this and I say, set the next slide to be myself, OK, then we should get that last slide repeating over and over again. So the first slide plays for seven seconds.
And then the second slide plays for seven seconds, and it'll just keep on repeating itself. So if I click on this link, it will take me back to the beginning of the tour. Okay. So finally, I want to save this. All that data that we were just manipulating in Excel in the spreadsheet has been pushed back into the telescope layer manager up here. It's been now serialized into the tour file so that if I send Mike this tour file that I just saved, it's the file extension is WTT, then Mike will be able to open the data, the file back up, the tour file, and in addition to admiring my artistic ability and rendering the perspectives and the music I added and so forth, here's the music adding stuff over here. Uh, he will also have access to this layer data. Okay. So that concludes then the whole um, going from tours to layer manager to Excel and back again to tours. So you yeah. have access to the layer data? So when you send me that file, that layer data is also embedded in that file? Yeah, when you send me the tour file, this slip event data is embedded in that file. Okay, what else? Yes. So if you have multiple layers with the different time scales, which one takes the precedence? So if you have di multiple layers with different time scales, let's say that their time scales are like this, right? If you highlight this one, then the time slider is going to match this one. If you highlight this one, the time slider will match this one. You can also create a dummy layer that starts here and ends here, and then the time slider will match this time range, and when you drag it back and forth, both data sets will render. So right now, the way that this works is you are basically engaging a layer to determine the start and end point of this time slider. But the system knows about all the data that's currently active. And by active, I mean it has a check mark here. And anything that's valid in the time range, the, state, the time state of the client will be rendered. And what if the time resolution itself is different? What if the time resolution itself is different? That's a, that's a difficult problem. Um, Jonathan talks about the mantis squeeze problem, that you can have data that's compressed to a second and data that runs for seven centuries. It's very difficult with the precision that we have in the system. So that's something you basically have to work with. Um, Jonathan's working on a sort of an adaptive scheme that will look at the time range of the data you care about and give you more dynamic ability to render that. But in the case of some of my data, I've actually expanded it out and Jonathan will have a comment. Like example being the hurricane season, like the hurricane comes in but it takes days before it hits the land. Right. Once it hits the land, we want to see every second data. Right. So, so adaptive. Right. The example is a hurricane coming in taking days and then when it hits you want to see data second by second. Jonathan, did you have a comment there? Yeah, I think that sort of thing you need to actually adapt the the timing to where you have one slide um, that is at one time rate, you know, to go through with compressed time, and then you start another slide at a slower time rate, another slide at a slower time rate, and then you actually, uh, uh, we can actually show the time rate um, as your, uh, you know, displayed as, as text on it. And so what you can do is you can actually transition and show that you're, you know, now X1000, X100, X10, you know, real time or something. And for instance, we've used that when we're showing an eclipse, where we won't bore you with uh, waiting hours and hours for the sun to, you know. But once you start the eclipse, um, and then you get closer and closer, we slow it down, the time rate down, until it's a one-to-one. -one. And then after the eclipse is over, we can speed it up again. So you can see the whole event without having to wait for hours. Uh, but you do that basically one slide at a time. And then just you need to explain to people that time is shifting in, in how fast the time rate is. Um, so the the issue right now is that uh, the the current release that's on the web right now, if you have things that are good to a resolution of one millisecond and you have a thousand years worth of them, uh, all stuck in one single layer, um, because of the way that the the a lot of the processing is done in floating point on the the CPU, the dates the extreme range of, of both large dates and uh, a fine resolution that you'll lose the fine resolution on it. So if you have several layers that are each grouped uh, um, by by time, where you have say this is a you know 10 minutes worth of data in one layer, 
that you'll have all the time resolution you need for that. But if you try to stuff in things going over millions of years and milliseconds all at the same time, you run out of resolution in the GPU to be able to express both realistically. And you can't jump over millions of years and care about the fidelity of a millisecond without slowing time down. Right, for but the, and the example that you gave where you do care about going from a time a, a scale of days down to time scale of seconds, I think Jonathan's point is apt that you should think about each slide in a tour, for example, as having its own time playback. So the, the, the watch time of a given slide might be 10 seconds or five minutes, whatever you like, but it will have a start time and an end time that will be what you're interested in, and then the subsequent um, tour slide has a different time scaling factor built into it. So that would be one way of sequentially going through time in different ways, just like as in the eclipse example. So it's, uh, it's 11.40, and I had a couple of other things to point out, uh, including some details on the LCAPI. And our official stop time is 12.30, that's right. But I don't think we'll go that long. Yeah, well, lunch is going to be available like 12. OK. So you can stop any Okay, um, so yeah. remind everybody that Visual Studio is on all the machines in front of you, and I think you're going to move into a space that's going to require them to get into it. You're showing yeah. some code, um, yeah. but I'm not sure if the uh, how the share is set up. Um, so whether or not you'll be able to open up this code and, and poke around with it, and it might almost be better to just get the uh, the visual overview up here that I'll show of how the code looks and, and what it's doing. Uh, and then we can go back into it after that. Um, so right, yeah. once I get down from here. Good, but we haven't used it yet. So later on, maybe we can put some common files on that shared, yeah. and everybody can refer to it. Right. And in particular, so again, I use the term LCAPI like second nature. I, I will now, again, explain what it means. LC st stands for loosely coupled API applications programming interface, I think. And the idea of the LCAPI is, again, that you create an application it could be a script file, Python, you know, MATLAB for all I know. Um, or you can use uh, Visual Studio, .NET, C Sharp. Uh, or you can use the Excel add-in makes use of this. But we're, we're past the Excel <coughs> add-in now. Uh, and you format um, statements that are sent to a, a port. And that allows you to converse with Worldwide Telescope. So we're just going to talk about that. And we're going to make available two code examples. These are uh, Visual Studio, written in Visual Studio using Visual Studio. One of them is a dev tool, and it's very useful because it allows you to see the message that you're sending to Telescope and the message the Telescope sends back to you. So I'm going to try and run that in a minute, and you'll see how that works. Uh, there's another example here, uh, a, se a second example that will also be available. It's basically um, a, tab a box of tabs, and each tab is a different type of data, and you can push the data from Telescope in. That's, how I, th that's where that molecular cloud uh, example is from. OK, we also have documentation for how to use the LC API. And that will be available on the, share, on the file share. Uh, and that's an HTML document. You just double click on it, and it gives you all the nuts and bolts for how to, to format your statements. And then we'll make this deck available also. OK. So um, I'm going to back up for a second. Um, I'm going to skip the OData example. Uh, we'll see more about OData later today, I think, and the uh, important aspect of the OData interface is that um, Excel, the Office application, does not natively support an OData data connection. You can ex connect Excel, for example, to a database, uh, but you can't go out on the web and find some right now at the moment. You can't find some OData source. However, there's an add-in to Excel, and it's really kind of a, a, a super powerful application masquerading as Excel called Power Pivot which I think we also are going to see a presentation on. And Power Pivot does speak OData. So the example that I'm not going to show is from nerddinner.com. And you go out to the site, and it exposes an OData service. And you use Power Pivot to talk to that and pull in some data. It's, it's uh, time-dependent data. It's latitudes and longitudes of dinners for uh, people who consider themselves nerds, which I am proudly one. So, the idea then is you pull that data into uh, Power Pivot, and then you do a little bit of massaging on it, and suddenly you have this flat file in Excel, and you know how to put that into Worldwide Telescope. So it's not a perfectly smooth one-shot deal, but there is a way of connecting OData data source to Worldwide Telescope. Okay, 
So I wanted to mention that um, without belaboring it, uh, just to sort of keep us on track. OK, so the LC API is sort of like J Jonathan likes to say, it's semi-restful because it uh, includes a payload string. That's how we get the data into Telescope is through the payload string. And there's a couple of technical details here, but I think I should just move on to, to opening up the application. And if it works, then we're in business. OK. So here's our application. And again, you're getting all this code that's sitting behind there. And if I slide it over to the side, I get approximately half a window's worth of stuff. There's this nice text box here, which is this is what I send. And then there's, here's what come back, comes back from Telescope. So I'm going to open up Telescope, and I'm going to do the same half a window trick here. And um, the first thing we'll do is we'll just click this button, Traverse to New York. So that uses a fly to command. So that's part of the URL is fly to, and then you pass it some other parameters. And traverse, by the way, means gla gracefully pan across the Earth until you reach the point where I'm telling you to go. And you, it's, a, it's a Boolean flag. If you set it to false, it'll just jump there. OK, so without further ado, we're now gracefully sliding to New York. Hopefully the one in the US. OK, so it's done. It's now flown to New York. But I say, well, I'd like to zoom in a little closer. And, and I understand that they have uh, an air museum floating on an aircraft carrier. So I'd like to get a little closer to it. And sure enough, there's our little air museum. So I've used zoom in and zoom out buttons. And every time I do that, it prints a new uh, thing that I'm sending. And then the response. The responses have been just a nice, happy success here. So the commands have been in the format command equals move, and move equals zoom in. And this is all stuff that's available through the LC API. I can move left, move down, move right. I can zoom out. And I can also, instead of panning to New York, I can also jump to New York like that. So instantly, you don't have to wait for the panning to happen. Yes, Mike? So this is basically just a REST API talking to that particular instance of Worldwide Telescope on this, your machine. It's not a server. That's right. This is a REST, REST-like API talking to this instance of Worldwide Telescope client on my machine. So you're, can you just control the interface over there? Those are put. Post requests? Are they put or post? I think they're post because they carry a payload string, right? There, there's a combination of some that are get and, and some that are post. If you if you do if you um, have a, uh, uh, a say, for instance, you can set properties on a layer. Uh, so all of the properties that are exposed inside a layer uh, can be set. You can do it with a get. API one at a time, or you can do a post API with an XML packet that basically sets all the properties all at once in a single instance. Are you going to support all four verbs, like delete, as well? Well, that's that's why I have a. Um, Rob wanted to say I say it's not a REST API. Okay, low REST. Yeah, low REST so, API. So, um, but it's it uh, essentially uh, your it's it's a. It's a it's a, it's a, it's basically a loosely coupled uh, function call type. Okay. Uh, function call properties can be set on on different layers, and you can get, um, you can get like the entire list of available layers, all their properties, set properties against them, uh, and then do actions uh, against the user interface. So there's there's a. a Pretty significant functionality that uh, allows you to, to allows you to access a significant amount of functionality from anything that can create an HTML request, either post or get. Okay, so um, I'm going to belabor this just a little bit further. Um, hopefully, that, is that a, you get your. 
Uh, I'm going to click on this get state command, and you'll notice the it says command equals state, and the reply that came back from telescope was this long string of text. Um, I had success. I'm looking at the Earth. Here's the latitude, the longitude, the zoom level, uh, the angle, and the rotation. That's tilt and, and uh, azimuthal. Uh, it's telling me the time, the time rate, or the rate at which time is currently playing back, which is real time. <coughs> the reference frame is the Earth. There's a token here. And then there is some zoom text, 493 kilometers. So that's what a get state does. Now I'm going to um, go ahead and create a layer. And that did th what that did is uh, in three steps. First, it created a new layer here, which was replied to with this layer ID, which is then the handle to refer to that layer in the future. The second thing it did was it updated the layer properties. And so here's the HTTP send. There's the port 5050. And here's the layer ID. And it appears that this did what Jonathan was saying. It set a whole bunch of layer attributes at once by using this XML string. So it's a new layer. It's which columns are latitude and which are longitude and so forth. And then the last thing it did was it actually sent the data in. So the colors are red, blue, and 90% green. So let's go find that layer. Somewhere on this earth, there are three dots. There they are. OK. So hopefully this is uh, clear what's going on here. It's just a, an interaction. Yeah. Uh, exactly. With respect to this, uh, let's say I want to create a tour or even use your tool to where in the world is Carmen San Diego. And I don't know where this point is going to be. Now, these are relatively big points. But let's say now I want to shift either to a location. So I don't know what are the longitude and latitude uh, properties of LA. Or I want to shift now to the biggest earthquake. So once, one time I want to search for a city, and one time I was, would like to search for activity. Are these possible? OK, so the question is, can I search for a city? Can I search for an activity in your data table? And my answer is that that is a functionality in, in keeping with the philosophy that the telescope doesn't know about cities, right? That you want to have that intelligence in your external application. And the way to do that is to have some kind of a, a data table that's laid out that's searchable. And I think I, I might have mentioned to you yesterday um, that uh, we have, the, for example, SQL Server, um, SQL Spatial Library, uh, which has a bunch of built-in um, search stuff. Is Ed here in the room at the moment? Ed, do you want to stand up and give an example of how, uh, this is Ed Catabaugh, he's a SQL spatial guru and, uh, and a great guy. And uh, he's got uh, this huge experience in doing spatial searching. So can, can you elaborate a little bit on, give us the, the elevator pitch on SQL spatial and, and so forth? Sure. So. Um, how many are familiar with SQL Server Spatial? I see a few familiar faces in the room. So um, SQL Server Spatial basically is an open geospatial, simple features for SQL uh, implementation um, inside SQL Server and, of course, now inside SQL Azure. And we've got two main data types, a flat earth or planar uh, geometry. And we've got a geography type for spherical ellipsoidal uh, computations. Uh, we can do all the stuff that everybody seems to want to do, uh, buffering, points and polygon, distance, um, all of that good stuff. Literally, um, you know, dozens, probably around 70, 75 methods on each type. Um, support all kinds of neat things. Also, handle the entire globe as a single queryable entity. I believe that's the first time that's ever been done in a relational database. It will be coming out in the new Denali release. Um, and, of course, all of this is available in SQL Azure. So, um, uh, same, same library. So, that also begs the question, how do you do all of this? Since it's done as a CLR UDT, uh, we expose a library. And that library is fully uh, downloadable and freely licensable and usable anywhere. Uh, I have a, currently a customer that's using the library in Windows Azure uh, to do processing using SQL Azure just as the persistent data store and then scaling out in the mid-tier with all these spatial operations. So um, wonderful library. Uh, Great approach, and uh, I'll be talking about it more tomorrow. Yes. Okay. Super. Cool. So, it, it, is it correct 
my, my understanding, I want to verify this is correct, is that I could use the SQL spatial library to do these kinds of queries that Barack is describing without ever actually having access to a SQL database or to Azure or anything. I'm just working over on my machine over here. Can I query my own internal guts data that has a spatial content if it's Absolutely. What you would do is obviously serialize into our um, uh, on-disk uh, binary structure, which all the serialization, deserialization uh, methods are, are available in that library. The only thing the library does not have is an indexing strategy. The indexing, of course, that we did was done internal to SQL Service that would wor work with the query optimizer and things of that nature. So, um, of course, it's not hard. I mean, there are bazillions of different spatial uh, indexing strategies that one could deploy, but we do not surface that in the library. Library. Okay. Okay. Great. So that's a, at least a partial answer for how to do this stuff. But the, I think the, the, the zeroth order answer is you want the intelligence to live in your app, not in Telescope. But the message that I made at the very beginning of all this is bring us your requirements, bring us the kind of stuff that you want to do because we're malleable. We have a, a roadmap that's established, but it's very flexible and we can bring in new ideas and new requirements based on the kind of stuff you want to do. Okay, so I'm going to, um, I think I'm going to call it there. Um, I pushed in a layer. There's, there's all kinds of other details in here, but because you'll be able to grab these bits, this code, and, and play around with it yourself, I think that um, we should call this a good stopping point. Um, and at this point, let's, uh, if Yen is, is amenable, let's uh, yes. amen, open it up to more. Yes. Just give some free discussion. Any question, any thoughts at all? Just throw them out before we go for food. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. okay. I have a mic. Anything you want to say for now? Here. So if I'm looking at the uh, sending, uh, just to make sure that I got it correctly, so basically the uh, WWT serves as a uh, server listening, either though you're calling clients listening on 50-50, and I'm sending uh, these uh, HTTP requests. Right. You can also send an HTTP request to the client, to, the, to Worldwide Telescope, that says, go to this file and read the data that's there. So you can actually direct the telescope client to go suck in data out of a file. Is it, is it, uh, is it possible to run a uh, cl client on one machine and the software on different machines? So like a presentation mode and from yes. far away? You know. Yes, it is possible to run the client on one machine and run the control software on another machine. In fact, that's the first thing that Dan Fay went off and, and did oh. when this stuff got built. So that you could, in fact, talk to, uh, if we were set up, I could talk to this entire room and be controlling all these telescopes. Okay. Okay. Comments? We, we could test it out right now, Rob. Yeah, should we do that? Look up with your IP address. Also, one of the things is while we've been showing this running on one screen, uh, the Worldwide Telescope, uh, the, the slides that I have at the end that I didn't get to uh, in, in my original talk, uh, basically we have cluster rendering capability that allow you to do visualization walls for like uh, lots of tiled LCD displays. Uh, you can also put together uh, multiple projectors that are calibrated and blended within Worldwide Telescope, so you can actually basically drop, uh, some, it's a fairly simple uh, layout where you can actually just drop some correspondence points onto the screen and turn a set of projectors into a single virtual display. Um, we also are installed uh, in planetarium, so you can do full dome planetarium mode. Um, and, and there's basically just any type of visualizations, uh, stereo, uh, with um, um, left and right eyes, you know, all sorts of other different types of ways that you can visualize it. And, and basically it uses network protocols to communicate between the nodes uh, to synchronize all of this. So essentially you can scale to, um, uh, you know, as, as many nodes as you want in the visualization. And literally we have, you know, uh, uh, setups that have, uh, you know, uh, dozens of megapixels uh, all, all rendering simultaneously off, off lots of uh, different displays. So um, it's something that's uh, natively built into Worldwide Telescope. And um, you can use that to, to have one remote slave or lots of different sa uh, remote slaves from different views. Okay. 
Any other? Uh, yeah. Uh, can you just talk to? Just hang on a sec. Let's get the microphone to you because it'll be. So we're recording the answers, okay. especially. So. Okay. <laughs> can you also talk to the web client? The web client of WWT. I know you have a local version. Oh yeah. yeah. So the web client, uh, as far as I know, Jonathan, is that true that you cannot talk to the web client at this stage? Just get him a dedicated microphone. The, the web client does not handle high capacity data visualization. Uh, so we, we, we say that the Worldwide Telescope, the uh, full desktop install can handle uh, hundreds of, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of, of uh, data points. Um, and uh, hundreds of thousands with lots of time steps, you know, millions with uh, single time steps. Uh, the uh, web client is more of dozens of points rather than tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. So the web client also, uh, because of the web sandbox, it cannot, uh, you can't talk to the web client uh, from the outside world currently right now. Uh, we're actually doing some work in the astronomy for something called WebSAMP that will actually break that rule, but that's uh, currently only for uh, other astronomy uh, um, uh, SAMP models. Can I, can I, uh just uh, completely veer to the left here, I'd like to point out that I'm currently not touching my computer, and yet some maniac has commandeered my computer and is sending LCAPI commands to it, and it's moving around. I, I suspect it's my boss, it's Dan Fay is sitting in the back there. So this is an example of using uh, exactly what the gentleman was asking for to, to control a, another machine. You want to say something? Oh, no. I don't yeah. have anything to say. All right. Anything else? 